Namaste and welcome to the Festival of Bharat. My name is Kamal Madi Shetty and you're tuned into the season 4 of the Festival of Bharat. We are a platform that believes in having open and frank conversations about Bharat with no holds bar. And today we are going to discuss a very important topic, the art and culture of Bharat and why it matters. And to discuss this, we have a very special guest with us today, Dr. Sonal Mansingh ji. Sonal ji is a member of parliament. She was nominated by the president of India to the Rajya Sabha in July 2018 in recognition of her lifelong dedication and service to India's arts. She is the recipient of the Padma Vibhushan in 2003 from the then president APJ Abdul Kalam ji and Padma Bhushan in 1992 from former president R Venkat Raman ji. She has also been nominated as a Navratna for the Swachh Bharat mission by Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi ji. Her unique contribution has been her lifelong work using her knowledge to address socio-cultural issues through her chosen medium of dance as a soloist, teacher, choreographer, and a motivational speaker. Her, uh, as a founder uh, president of the Kamakya Kalapit, which is Center for Indian Classical Dances established in 1977 at Delhi, she has trained several thousand talented students who are carrying the message of Indian uh, culture globally. She teaches art as a holistic concept, combining music, yoga, Sanskrit, and cultural traditions of India. Dear viewers, it is my privilege to welcome Dr. Sonal Mansingh ji. Namaste, uh, Sonal ji, and welcome to the Festival of Bharat. Namaste, namaste. Pleasure to be with you again. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, uh, Sonal ji. I have a lot of questions in my mind, uh, uh, Sonal ji, but I want to begin uh, by asking you about, in many ways, uh, a kind of an origin to our culture, uh, uh, particularly in the field of performing arts, that is the Natya Shastra. It is one of the oldest texts on performing arts and is also often referred to as the fifth Veda. Uh, what does the Natya Shastra convey about the importance of art and aesthetics, in your view, uh, in the Bharatiya civilization? Uh, could you tell us how, uh, or also broadly, how Indian texts have provided the foundations uh, for various aspects of performing arts uh, in the modern world, uh, from setting a stage to design to lighting, uh, among many other things? It's uh, quite... Uh not funny, but not, not even strange, but a lot of people find it a little sort of irritating that each time we talk about arts in Bharat, India, and culture, we always have to hark back to <laughs> some hundreds of thousands of centuries. And uh, in, in, in this, our contemporary world, I think ours is the only country, nation, which can really boast. I would say, why not boast about things which are true and which are unique? Can boast about a continuing stream of consciousness. And this consciousness <clears throat> is not only about arts and culture, it's about the philosophy of life what we call dharma, the cosmic code by which the entire cosmos, the universe moves, rotates, expands, and lives, and how the atoms dance in space. So the connections are so many, which we find uh, somehow very natural to understand. It is in our genes, it's in our ethos. But it's difficult to explain in so many words how we look at life as a tapestry of interconnected threads and they all converge to make a beautiful design which we call life. So life is not only about science, it's not only about astronomy, not only about quantum physics and uh, chemistry and whatever. In fact, quantum physics is something that we understand so easily. 
it is <laughs> it is exactly what we talked about when shunya was just you know invented and then onwards quantum physics is the big word now the technical term but for us it has been always there and it has helped us to understand so many things in life which we call mysterious or the mystique of life and all this when it is conveyed through beautiful stories which we call purana and our purana are not just stories as they understand in the west they call them myth m y t h <clears throat> now myth is something like a fairy tale they are made up whereas puranas are something that is puratana something that happened long ago but they have remained in the collective memory of a people and so therefore these are not just stories but the stories that happened about people about characters about situations about kingdoms about men and women and puranas and upanishads and the vedas and the aranyakas and the brahmanas and the, i mean you were talking about texts it's it's mind boggling even to start because on one original text say ramayana the story of ram and sita there are more than a thousand commentaries and there are commentaries on commentaries and there are poems and prabandhas and natya geets and so many genres from that one text and that that text is historic it happened in the treta yuga and now the <clears throat> number of millennia is also calculated exactly but the questions are raised were were there some people like that did it happen then we show them the proof the is <clears throat> what is astronomy the stars the planets at that time the ram setu in sri lanka and uh, so many things in india also so i think that the modern mind finds it very difficult to understand to comprehend the enormity the vast canvas of what we call the interlinkages connections between art culture knowledge philosophy history and life of a nation and this is what makes bharat very unique so art and culture the performing arts have a very special place have always had a very special place and we love to quote from the rigveda the oldest text in the world that um, samrishi has described the on coming of dawn dawn the usha usha appears comes like a dancer floating in her pink raiment in her pink scarf the clothes because the early dawn has this pinkish sky then slowly it opens up and gets orangish before the sun rises but usha is imagined the dawn as a dancer and we have these similes everywhere the it's isn't it beautiful to to think <clears throat> that in the <clears throat> in our traditions all the gods and goddesses are dancing and singing they all hold some instrument or other the rishis the seekers the seers in meditation they saw this and they saw the image of the dancing shiva the i mean you know this uh, image of nataraja is established in cern c e r n near geneva in switzerland the headquarters of the atomic energy uh, research and they and if you remember fritz of capra the famous um, uh, physicist he has put nataraja on the cover of his book 
the Tao of physics and has drawn the chart of the energy circles and the energy uh, triangles and the energy maps. <clears throat> so what I'm saying is that what appears to be difficult to understand, to comprehend, comes very naturally to the Indian artist. The swaras, the sapta swaras, the seven notes, they are connected to the seven ratnas, the uh, 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 jewels, uh, the, uh, what shall I say, precious stones, to the seven colors, to seven stages of e evolution. The seven sapta swaras, as simple as that. But then nothing is really simple. Everything is connected. Everything is very deep, but one can go as deep as you want or not go at all and just enjoy the visual, the oral and the emotional. And that is the beauty. It does not make demands on anyone. You want to swim and <clears throat> submerge in the ocean of Ananda and ocean of knowledge, you are welcome. You just want to touch the water, you are welcome. If you just want to sit on the <laughs> banks and observe, you are welcome. You don't want to see or hear anything, so be it, no problem. And this ease of approach, I think is also something very unique. Thank you so much, Sonalji. Uh, I think you put the richness, the depth, and the diversity of uh, uh, Indian culture beautifully. Uh, and I want to go into uh, uh, some of uh, each of what you've said uh, slightly more deeply. Um, and that brings me to my second question. Um, uh, you spoke about how uh, the, the, uh, the dance of Shiva uh, represents uh, the cosmic cycle of life. Uh, I want to understand what does Nataraja signify um, as an embodiment of Shiva um, in the form of a creator, destructor, an artist, um, and an embodiment of the entire cosmos. Can you tell us about that? <laughs> um, the word destruction or destroy is something that is terribly misplaced, according to me. Let us displace it. <laughs> with um, the, the cosmic cycle, as everybody understands, that the seasons come, seasons change. Breath comes, breath goes. The Prithvi, Earth goes round on a certain axis and uh, <clears throat> goes in an elliptical circle around the sun. And there are not just not one solar system of which we are the smallest planet. There are innumerable numberless solar systems in the ever expanding space, Akasha. Now, such a grand vision. And I think this is the speciality of the Indian mind that while describing the majesty they can encapsulate it with an image or with a sutra. With just it, then you start dissecting it layer by layer, trying to understand it, and you say, Oh, okay. So, Nataraja is that image. <clears throat> it's beautiful, it's um, mesmerizing. It is very mystical, but on surface, it is just, you feel that now he's going to take a full turn. The raised left leg of Nataraja, the left leg is raised. The right is firmly planted on a dwarf figure. Many people ask, uh, when you take the Nataraja pose, do you then complete the circle or is it the circle that you have made the pirouette chakkar, and you have not yet put your foot back? What is it? This is a legitimate question. <clears throat> and so 
the whole image of Nataraj is, is all about the waves, the vibrations, imagining going back to what the West started calling the Big Bang. But we don't say Big Bang. We say from Brahman, that which is indivisible, indescribable, without form, without attribute, and yet there is that, that, that <clears throat> when becomes two, and it's so poetically described that in that T H A T, all capital, they arose maybe a desire to be two. So from the Dvaita, from the Advaita came the Dvaita, from one into two. And these two are the opposing principles so that the balance is always maintained. For balancing, you need two. The, the vibrations of that movement, that moment, one into two, they started going forward. And these vibrations then create images with atoms. We are all atom. We are all atomic, actually. <coughs> and when we dissolve at death, again, what we say, parashakti, paramshakti, atma, atma, uh, atma, paramatma, actually we dissolve into cosmic atoms. Now, Nataraja, the image, if you remember, there are four arms, the super divine. So the upper right arm holds a damaru, that small instrument, cylindrical instrument, damaru. Now that are the sound vibrations. These are the first sound vibrations because vibrations, sound. And in the left upper arm, for a hand, he holds the fire. These are the vibrations creating light. Why fire? That fire removes darkness and gives light. It removes darkness and gives light. And the right lower arm hand is shown in the Pataka Hasta, we call it Abhaya Mudra. Abhaya, Bhaya is fear. Abhaya, no fear, fear not. That is the benediction. And the left lower arm is thrown across the torso, which is we call in a Kari Hasta <clears throat> posture. Kari is elephant, like the elephant trunk. And the palm is pointing downwards towards that figure, that small dwarf figure, and Shiva's right foot stamped on it. Why? Because from light we have knowledge, we have light of knowledge or buddhi or pragya, but that little dwarf figure is symbol of ignorance as opposed to knowledge. And therefore it is all misshapen. And Shiva firmly is pressing on the spine of that dwarf figure because we know the Kundalini rises through spine and that Aghata that Shakti Pata has to be given, that stroke of Shakti to remove, to straighten the spine, which means to remove ignorance and enlighten the dwarf, called Apasmara Purusha. Muelagan is called in South India. <clears throat> the left leg is raised in a very beautiful posture. And this that once ignorance goes, 
the evolution happens. The uplifting of universe, of cosmic life starts. Very simply put, this is the image. And then of course you have the matted, the hair flying also. And here the river Ganges, Ganga. Now Ganga is actually the flow of energy, the flow of energy. You need energy to enliven the creation. Ganga is not just a river. Of course, it's a river for us in India and one of the big rivers in the world. Gam Gachatiti Ganga. Anything that flows is Ganga. And this is the flow of energy. Without energy, there's nothing. And uh, <clears throat> the moon, the moon is there as a symbol of the planetary systems which Shiva, this Nataraja figure, points to upholding all the planetary figurations, configurations in space. And the third eye is the mystical eye. We all have it. And that is the yoga diksha. That is what the dikshit people who are seekers and seers, they get from their guru when the guru presses here and awakens as if, as it were, your inner eye, third eye, the mystical point, which is, I think, in Christianity also, when they baptize and all that. Now, apart from that, there are several other symbols. But coming to your basic point, the creation begins with the vibrations. Creation continues with the constant flow of energy. And where the knowledge arises with the fire and creation goes into dissolution. It is dissolved before it is resolved again and comes into being. Anything that is has to dissolve again to blossom. So it's a constant movement. And that movement is shown through the, <clears throat> as if he's about to turn. And that is the dissolution. We dancers have, I mean, I, 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 I find any, every time I look at Nataraj or I dance or I teach, I do find newer symbols and newer meanings. So that is not a static posture. It is a posture like the eye in the storm. In all these hurricanes and cyclones, they, they have the eye, the center point, around which things are happening. Now, <clears throat> this moment, which was seen with the mystical eye of some Rishi, some Muni, was that moment when, in the middle of the world, Shiva. It's a fantastic, fantastic I, I haven't seen anything like that, and I've traveled to world museums, smallest, biggest, like the in, in Nicosia in Cyprus. They have 8,000 year old figurines, mother goddess, and in Ankara, and in, um, where, uh, in, in Latin America. I've been to all these places, and I always go to the museums. It's amazing that in ancient India, mother goddesses were there everywhere because it, they, all the old civilizations were, yes, centered around the mother figure. It's only here that Nataraja has come into being as a male protagonist of this entire movement of creation and dissolution and in, within that space, so many things happen. Eons, Kala Chakra is what we call, no? The cyclical eons happen. Ah, amazing. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely Solarji. Uh, absolutely, it's, it's uh, amazing and very, very fascinating. Um, and there is so much of depth that I think, um, especially people from my generation have to understand. 
uh, thank you so much for sharing those insights. Uh, You're welcome. This is, hello. I'm, uh, may I add that this is in my own small understanding. And I'm sure there is much, much more to it. Absolutely. I think, like you said, it's, it's something that um, there's a constant discovery and uh, we sort of uh, explore more and more as we uh, understand it. Um, so there is also this rhythm to everything, uh, be it cosmic movement of planets or uh, beating of one's heart. Um, and we, in our culture, we have a very uh, profound emphasis on rhythm. So uh, do you feel that uh, at an individual level, when one has a knowledge of music and dance, that adds a rhythm to our lives? Definitely. Certainly. Very good question. Uh, this is something that I have repeatedly said in my interviews, lectures, commentaries, that without rhythm, without appreciating the rhythm, as you said, within our own body, first of all, the breath, the inhalation, exhalations, it's not only through yoga, but for any thinking person, it's clear that when your breath becomes uneven, when you are excited or when you're angry, your breath is uneven. When you are calm, happy, your breath is even. But also when you're about to fall sick, the breath becomes uneven. To, 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 to uh, compare that breath, the cycle of breath, then we have all these talas, what we call tala, the huh? tala pramanas, the rhythmic cycles. So when you are uh, excited or you're, takita, 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 ta, 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 ta. You know, you are takita, takka, dhimmi, takita, takka, dhimmi. Yeah. And takka, dhimmi, takka, dhimmi, takka, dhimmi, takka, dhimmi. Four, four. Takka, dhimmi, takka, dhimmi, takka, dhimmi, takka, jhanu. Takka, dhimmi, takka, jhanu. With the breath, you can take, go on to, to the rhythm. Yeah, the, your walk. So I, what I want to say is that betala, most people are betala in their thoughts, in their speech, and in their life. They have no rhythm. And they are basically not happy people. They may be very rich. They may be very powerful. But they are betala. And from betala pan comes besura. It's, it's um, an offending kind of a, a vani. Uh, it, offend, it offends, it is karkash, karnakatu, or just without any emotion. It doesn't convey anything. That kind of a people speak speech, you know. Where does it all come from? From being ignorant, as you said, of the basic rhythm of life, the basic melody of life also is a melody. And that melody we fail to hear because our ears like this plug with the technology or with WhatsApp or with YouTube, increasingly with the kolahal outside, the, the, the noises, the traffic, people shouting and demands and technology and social media, we do not hear the inner music. So um, inner music, which is aligned to outer music, what uh, poets have called music of the spheres, spheres, the akasha of space. And astronauts who have gone into space, they have recorded that sound. And that sound is what is like Om. That sound is something that is constant within our body with the circulation of the blood. 
with the with the with the sans with the breath but we don't hear it and therefore it's very important to be quiet to no, i won't say meditate to be quiet to learn to be quiet even among pandemic all kinds of pandemics and all kinds of pandemoniums we have to learn to be quiet inside even while i speak now my one consciousness is here with you another one is listening to what i'm saying and that is working within me that is the deep well of calmness from where the thoughts arise so this is a very beautiful thing to be able to understand even that why life has a rhythm why breath has a rhythm why circulation of blood has a rhythm why seasons have a rhythm why the uh, turning of earth has a rhythm and the way it moves around the sun in 365 days it has a rhythm every planet has its own rhythm like my rhythm may not be your rhythm but then we have a collective rhythm when we are all together so uh, that is what where the our tala system is based on on that that the same chaturasra 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 1 2 3 4 chaturasra four beats basically how <clears throat> how they can be manipulated played on tabla on pakhmaj and vidangam by the feet the ghungrus with the movements with only the istak dhimmi tak dhimmi tak dhimmi tak jhadu 1 2 3 4 1 2 3 4 1 2 3 4 and that can be into halves to one half one quarter into infinity and it can go into infinity the other way round 4 8 16 32 onwards 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 now this is called the basic rhythm of life sarvalagu chaturasra so simple to understand that when we talk if we speak in sarvalagu chaturasra it is very clear people can understand something is conveyed but if you speak like you know i was just say yeah yes yeah, i i don't blah, blah, blah. nothing is understood is takita 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 go no so one has to understand the rhythm contained in your body contained in the seasons contained in the earth rotation and contained in life everywhere beautiful question you put now you know one can go on and on and on but so basically melody and rhythm they go hand in hand every melody has a rhythm every rhythm has a melody and beyond that is cosmic silence absolutely i think a simple act of silence and being uh, being able to listen and appreciate our own rhythm can go a long way in uh, appreciating the rhythms around us as well um so i want to actually uh, go from rhythms to what you mentioned uh, you spoke about om um, and we believe that om is anantanad uh, it's the origin of all sounds in the universe and uh, it's certainly uh, foundational in many ways to uh, indian music forms uh, but we also see similarities uh, between our sargams and uh, those in the western classical uh, music like do re mi fa sol la ti and uh, so what are these similarities like and uh, how much does uh, actually the western classical music draw from indian music no no do re mi fa sol la ti do are the basic notes seven notes uh in the uh, mongoloid cultures that is in um, mongolia china uh, korea and all these they have the pentatonic melodies they have sa re ga pa da sa sa da pa ga re sa or durga 
सारे मरे और दे हैव भैरवी सो इट इज नॉट दैट सेवन नोट्स आर एवरीवेयर इन एवरी कल्चर बट दैट यू स्पोक अबाउट द वेस्ट दैट इज यूरोप एंड बेसिकली यूरोप एंड देन ऑफ कोर्स अमेरिका एंड एवरीवेयर नाउ the the entire music is built on very different principles it's very very different so the change of keys happens midway and uh, uh, what you call sargam sare ga re ga pa ga pa ta pa ta they 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 had that in opera and in the lead uh, leader uh, lead in german is song in their uh, poems which are sung of goethe of schiller of so many and the operas the big operas you know so there the coloratura the the sargams happen in their own we cannot we cannot do it they cannot do what we are doing but i don't think they've drawn much from indian music yes individual musicians for example yehudi menuhin the great violinist and pandit ravi shankar they uh, they did fusions in that time and jean paul rampal the flutist the famous flutist he also played with um, indian instruments indian orchestra similarly uh, our uh, l subramaniam pandit ravi shankar of course and so many others they are now playing with uh, philharmonics and symphony orchestras and they create special pieces based on indian ragas so i think this give and take is there but i will i won't say that uh, originally western music was based on indian music no they grew in different atmosphere and from different principles from different vision yes um uh, you earlier um, spoke about how Uh, there is a rhythm be it in speaking or the way we conduct ourselves uh, but we live in a world which is um, increasingly uh, depicted through emojis and animations especially when you look at whatsapp and social media so uh, how do you um, see uh, you know the navarasas i mean if we have to talk about the navarasas um, that transcend from a performance to a real life um, how how do you um, see that sort of interplaying with the kind of world that we are come to living uh, in today's times but you think that navarasa emojis are there not at all i mean uh, so how 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 does that uh, so there are hasya oh. the emojis there then one tear drop emojis are there karunya <laughs> and um, uh, eyes with like hearts for love shringa <laughs> no <laughs> and and you know this uh, mm, that is there for bibats or this day <laughs> so some are there <laughs> yeah but navarasa as applied to life i think every day we are from morning till night we are experiencing bhavas emotions the only thing is that unless the bhavas are intensified understood and portrayed in a particular way the rasa does not arise hasya rasa will arise of course from stupid things people say or uh, things that you know arouses people uh, into anger or that is not the point the point is that in our own own families in our own homes also the navarasa the nava bhavas are played out uh, for example uh the the shringara rasa the love is happening between uh lovers husband and wife or whatever whoever but then there is also vatsalya rasa within shringara which is parental love or love of the elder for the younger and then there is uh, the maitri bhava which is also love friendly and we love our friends and we'll do anything for our real friends and there is a dasatva where like meera and krishna or like akka mahadevi and shiva there is total surrender in love so the different uh, levels of love are there 
And uh, when we are doing our puja, and we are really tanmay, we are immersed in that bhava. At, in those moments, we are in love with whoever we are worshipping, or just sitting, thinking of, that is love. That is love. So quarrels happen, anger happens, and then sorry, crying, karunya happens, adbhuta happens. Oh, wonderful, I never imagined. And um, uh, this happens, uh, bhaya, what is that sound? Just see, huh? And vipatsa, I don't like that. No, no, I don't like that. Vipatsa happens. So all these are contained in our daily lives, in our interactions. Only if we try to analyze, then we can realize. You analyze, then you realize. Without that, it's just a whoosh of everyday life, mundane. But how mundane can become beautiful is by this method. That try to think, aha, this morning she gave me special paratha. Very nice. She made special idli and sambar. Did I thank her? Oh, what a moment of love that would have been. Let me go and hug her and thank her. Now that would become immediately uh, Shringara Rasa. So like that, I'm saying that life gives you so many moments to experience these. And from here only observing these uh, moments our Bharata Muni, and before him, so many Natya Acharyas, whom he mentions in his Bharata Natya Shastra, that they compounded, you know, they analyzed, and then they classified. How beautiful. The classification, I think, nobody can beat India. No country can beat India. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, uh, Sonalji, and uh, I think it's important to be conscious of that to experience it, like you said, analyze to actually realize it. Realize. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and we've spoken about, um, you know, Indian classical music, uh, Indian music and uh, Western music. Um, and that sort of brings me to the question about identity. Um, so when we see uh, artists, often, uh, especially those who have an international audience, uh, some tend to distance themselves from their own, uh, their identities. They sort of refuse to be identified uh, with a particular region or a country. Uh, and instead they sort of uh, are seen to embrace a kind of a global identity. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, something like this? Like how does identity um, uh, operate in the, in, the, in the space of, let's say, performing arts? <laughs> I suppose you are uh, referring to modern dancers, contemporary dancers, I, I guess. Yes. Because otherwise, in our uh, traditional, I won't call them classical, because classic is a period in, in Greece. Okay. We say Shastriya, that which per pertains to Shastras, like the Natya Shastra compendium, that our texts. So in our Shastriya dance forms, um, we have very, very uh, strong identities. I mean, I'm a Gujarati, born Gujarati, but when I dance Odissi, my total identification is with Odisha, the Odia culture and music and dance and sculpture. And I've learned Bharatanatyam even before Odissi from the age of seven. So when I dance Bharatanatyam, nobody can make out that I'm not South Indian, I won't say Tamil, because Bharatanatyam exists also in Karnatak and also in some parts of Andhra, it used to, Andhra was not there. Remember, it was a whole entire region. The Bhagavata Mela, Bhagavatars were there. And so when I dance that, my identity does not remain Sonal, the Gujarati girl, but it becomes totally merged into Bharatanatyam identity, what Bharatanatyam stands for. So we are very clear about our identity. It is for the contemporary dancers who also, I think most of them have learned Kathak or Kathakali, Bharatanatyam, Odissi, and then they sail out to um, uh, 
try different things. That's wonderful. That's good. It's, it's, it's up to them. You see, I don't believe in saying good or bad. Everything is good. Whoever is thinking, trying, trying to do something different is wonderful. That which has some sattva, you know, that which has something strong, that will stay. Other things will evaporate. You see them, then you are gone. In two years, five years, you don't hear about them or you don't hear about that particular genre that they tried to develop. So that's okay. And identity, I think, is a very strong word that some people, as you said, do not like. It's their lookout. I believe that if the tree has an identity, it is because of its roots. If the roots are not there, the tree has no identity because it's not there. And the deeper the roots, the taller and beautiful the tree is. So our roots are very, very firm and deep. And so we have grown with strong identities and proud of those identities. Like a lot of people used to ask me, why you do this, you used to do... Huh? I said, what a question. It's my own forehead. It's my own finger. It's my own kumkumam. What's your problem? <laughs> <laughs> why do you do this all the time? It's my eye. I'm putting my own kajal. I'm not borrowing from you. What's your problem? In fact, I would say, because of this, at this age also, I don't wear specs. And because of this, I feel so strong. Wherever I go, people recognize me. And the red color, it gives me the energy from the sun because this picks up the energy. That's why we put the red. The black and green and yellow and all that, that is all fashion. You know, that in many parts of India, even today, even men have the pottu, what we call the pottu, the kumkumam. Either they are shaktas or they are Vaishnavite or they have the uh, namam or the tripunda and a, and a pottu, red one, red mark. So the question should be, what does it signify? What does it do to you? Rather than why do you put it? Why is it that long? You know? And therefore, the identity which I carry makes me something, somebody unique. Among the millions of ordinary people, I become extraordinary also. Not only because of my dance. I'm not dancing 24 hours everywhere. But as Sonal Man Singh, with the, yes, I'm unique. <laughs> Absolutely. I think you put it very beautifully. Uh, the tree is only as strong, as magnificent as the roots are. And the deeper the roots, the stronger the tree is. Uh, I think uh, that sums it up message very beautifully. So we have spoken about uh, different things and various aspects of Bharatiya culture. And uh, it has, our culture has a lot to offer to the world, right? Because of the pandemic, uh, Namaste has been in the news <laughs> and you have spoken about this earlier as well um, and be it the Namaste, be it uh, the learnings from uh, Ramayana and Mahabharata. I'm very glad that, uh, you know, during this time, uh, a lot of uh, people have had the chance to actually go back and again watch uh, Ramayana and Mahabharata on TV and then again that sort of sparks curiosity um, for the younger generation. So uh, I was I wanted to know from you, you know, in terms of uniqueness, what, what, is, what makes Bharat's art and culture uh, unique? Before I um, say something, I'm glad you spoke about Ramayana and Mahabharata. I would request you and all your viewers to please go to my channel, YouTube channel, and see recordings of my Kala Yatra, 2020 festival on 10th October on Ramayana and on 11th October on Mahabharata in which we had invited reputed scholars to speak 
like Prasoon Joshi spoke on Jambavant, Dr. Bharat Gupta spoke on Bhishma Pratigya, uh, uh, like that, and dancers, dance groups uh, from Thailand, from Kerala, Kudiyattam, my own repertory group, and um, uh, Vanashri Rao's group, like that. So it's a very, and then we also showed some fantastic paintings, frescoes, temples, um, uh, folk art, folk music, folk, because you see, Ramayana and Mahabharata, like so many other Purana stories, whether Shiva Purana, Devi Purana, Devi Bhagavat, uh, from uh, Krishna, uh, uh, Srimad Bhagavat, these have, these have several levels, layers, right from the tribal, what we call the Vanajati, Janajatis, tribals, into up to folk arts everywhere in India, whether in painting, sculpture, metal art, wood art, dance, music, poetry, whatever. And rising up to the martial arts, the devotional arts, and our Shastriya arts. Be it music, be it dance, be it puppetry. So amazing, again, that canvas is so wide. And then, of course, the Bhagavatas, the Bhagavatulu, the Hari Katha Kalakshepam, my own Natya Katha, like that, and the Jatras, the folk theater in uh, every part of India, the Bhavai in Gujarat, and Jatras in Bengal, and Odisha, and Terukuthu in Tamil Nadu, and everywhere. Now, what is the connection? The connection is exactly what you asked. The connection is, again, our own history given to us in the form of stories. So we learn through them our history, our heroes, heroines, episodes, different characters, and dharma upadesha. Upadesha on dharma. Everything has upadesha, which means what? That a sense of good life, a sense of good behavior, a sense of good thinking, how you should behave in your life, what you should do, and how you should overcome obstacles, because obstacles come every day. So Ramayana and Mahabharata, of course, are our two great epics, which are history and poem at the same time. So these stories are all over, but with different again, with different views, viewpoints. In some, Draupadi is the main protagonist. In others, it's Duryodhana. In, you know, Duryodhana's temples in Uttarakhand and other places. Did you know that? There are several temples dedicated to Karna. There's, there are temples in Himachal Pradesh to Hidimba, the, uh, uh, the, the wife of Bhima, but she was uh, the Rakshasi you know, that uh, tribe. And uh, of course, the other temples, temples to Draupadi, even in South India. So it's a very, very eclectic art. The point is that we have 360 viewpoint on everything. That's the Indian mind. The Indian mind believes, but doesn't want to believe also. So that Commentaries on commentaries on commentaries. That's why. <laughs> I'll give you one simple. That there is Gita Ramayana, Ananda Ramayana, so many Kada, Kamba Ramayana in South, so many Ramayanas. These are all Tikas, commentaries on the Valmiki Ramayana, Tulsi Ramcharit Manas. Somebody told me in Ayodhya, there is a Gadabada Ramayana also. I mean, you know. And we love to make fun of our heroes and heroines also. Now, this Garman Rama, he just gave me one example. That after victory in Lanka, Sri Ram, Sita, Lakshman, Hanuman, everyone comes back to Ayodhya, to great celebration of Raja Bhisheka, the uh, uh, declaring Rama, Ramachandra as the king, all that. Now the entire Vanar Sena, the monkeys have come, Bhalus, 
who had uh, participated in the war. They've come back with him to celebrate. Now, one month has passed and um, the Sugriva and they, they all say that we must go back to our kingdom. And uh, thank you very much. So many presents have been given. Now, the young, young ones, the young monkeys, and the, especially the female monkeys, they all made a plea, a request that we want to have one more darshan of Maharani Sita, Sita Devi. So next day, the last darbar, the last congregation, and Sita Ji walks in with Ram, and this cheering and everything and everything, and then they all fall silent as they are seated on the throne. And one young monkey has got up and he's going here and he's going there. And then he starts clapping and jumping and saying, ha, 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 ha. And everybody is saying, hey, shut up. He said, everybody said, she's very beautiful. She doesn't even have a tail. <laughs> this is a viewpoint. You cannot ignore it. And this is the beauty, that accommodation of every viewpoint, everybody's thinking thoughts. We don't reject. We don't reject. And therefore, what people talk about today, I'm winking at you and your audience and your viewers, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of thought. It was all there. It has been there, Baba. What are we talking about? <laughs> Otherwise, there would have been. <laughs> we laugh and we enjoy. And we say, see, look, so many, wonderful. And this is the real Bharata. This is our Bharat, which people fail to understand today. So much junk is being fed. I'm very sorry to say that. So much junk is being fed every day. So I hope that our conversation gives some a little insight into what really was and is. We are lucky to have it even now in these times of technology and viral knowledge, Google Acharya. We are still lucky to have this consciousness, masters, seekers, seers, we are lucky. Hold on to it, experience it, share it. Absolutely, uh, beautifully uh, summarized, Sonalji. Uh, I think we are an inheritor. We are inheritors of a great culture and a great civilization. And I don't think anybody could have put it so uh, eloquently uh, as you have. And I'm sure that is going to inspire a lot of us uh, to actually discover our own culture. Um, thank you so much, uh, Sonarji, for this culturally immersive um, session. Uh, thank you so much for that. Thank you, thank you. Always a pleasure. God bless and protect us all. And may we continue carrying the messages forward to keep on enriching the people, generations. Thank you. Jai Mai. Jai Mai. Thank you so much, Sonalji. Uh, for our viewers, uh, we will be returning for another exciting conversation in the next session. So do follow uh, the Festival of Bharat on all the social media handles and do subscribe to both of our channels uh, because we will be posting content on both Festival of Bharat as well as our other uh, channel, Chitty Media. Namaste. We hope you enjoyed this Chitti Media content. Please remember to subscribe to us and switch on the notifications for this channel. For our other social media links, more content and to support our work, please visit citti.net. Dhanavad. Namaskar.